Good morning. I call to order this hearing of the Senate Tax Committee. The first item on our agenda is adoption of the minutes. Um, the minutes are before you. Are there any corrections? Seeing none, the minutes are approved as presented. The first bill on our agenda this morning is Senate File 2007, Senator Towsley. Um, welcome to the uh, committee and please present your bill. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for hearing this bill and members also. Um, this legislation attempts to increase resident ownership of manufactured home communities through an incentive approach uh, by giving an income tax credit for sellers. Uh, my testifier, Victoria Clark West of North Country Cooperative Foundation, will explain the bill in greater detail. The purpose of this legislation is to preserve and expand affordable home ownership in the most cost-effective way possible, while also creating a win-win for everybody. It is estimated that this legislation could convert two to six parks to resident ownership each year, thereby preserving hundreds of units of home ownership and keeping millions of dollars in the state, all the while costing the state less than a million per biennium. This legislation is supported by the Minnesota Manufactured Housing Association in addition to North Country Cooperative Foundation. I'll now hand it over to my testifier, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record, um, you may proceed with your testimony. Thanks very much. Uh, Victoria Clark West, uh, Executive Director at North Country Cooperative Foundation. Thank you, Senator Housley, for authoring this bill. Um, in, in short, this bipartisan legislation attempts to incentivize manufactured home park owners especially those smaller, uh, they're kind of colloquially referred to as mom and pops or family owned operators, uh, to sell their communities to the residents. Cooperative resident ownership is a proven model for sustainable long-term affordable home ownership. This legislation would provide a 5% tax credit, uh, line, that's line 1.17 uh, in the bill before you, to a manufactured home park owner that sells their community to a manufactured home park cooperative a nonprofit organization 317, organized under 317A or a representative acting on behalf of residents as already defined in statute. Uh, so why 5%? Um, uh, why did we land on that? In Minnesota, the, the top state capital gain tax liability for a sale would be 9.85%. A 5% income tax credit on the sale would essentially equate to about a 50% reduction in a park owner's Minnesota capital gain tax liability. Um, and why the need for this incentive, uh, really this legislation would incentivize park owners to sell to their residents, thereby serving two purposes. The beneficiaries of the credit and the preserved units would keep all of the money in Minnesota, um, as opposed to out-of-state investors uh, who drain the state of its wealth. We've seen a real uptick in that uh, trend in recent years, uh, uh, parks uh, converting to out-of-state investor ownership. And the second purpose is it, this will lead to long-term affordable home ownership in an incredibly cost-effective way. So what is the cost? We estimate that this legislation could convert two to six parks uh, to resident ownership per year, as Senator Housley mentioned, preserving hundreds of units of home ownership for less than a million, actually we got the revenue estimate um, uh, back from the Department of Revenue and it's less than a million dollars per biennium. Um, I'd like to refer you to your packets for a handout that displays a chart of the costs of this incentive. Um, and these are estimates based on um, uh, co-ops that we've converted to co-op ownership across the state in the last five years. So as you can see from previous conversions that our organization has uh, helped to facilitate, we could convert about 275 units into co-op home ownership for less than $330,000. That's a per unit cost to the state of about $1,200. As a comparison, preservation at the 30% AMI level uh, can often cost upwards of $300,000 a unit of public money. And of importance, co-op conversion has the potential to actually expand home ownership as all the communities that we work with uh, actively work and we work with them to fill uh, vacant lots in their communities with new energy efficient uh, manufactured homes, thus making this not just preservation but also production, which is important. 
And, and with that, I'd like to thank the committee for its time and stand for any questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, are there um, questions for Senator Housley or Ms. Clark West? Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this might be a, a question uh, more for staff. So, well, certainly, a thank you for bringing the bill, Senator Housley, and anything we can do to uh, encourage home ownership, I do think is important. It is, the, it is, I think, the best generational wealth builder. So if we're serious about closing gaps, home ownership is a key part of that. Um, but may, maybe to Ms. Pollock, um, I, I'm, and I might have misunderstood the testifier, I, but I don't want to um, misunderstand. Um, I thought I heard that a, a, another reason for, to, to support this bill is to uh, keep uh, the wealth in Minnesota as opposed to having out-of-state uh, buyers come in and buy the uh, mobile home park. But I believe Ms. Pollock, uh, even if someone were an out-of-state owner, they would still be paying uh, Minnesota income taxes on ta on or Minnesota taxes on uh, Minnesota um, property or Minnesota income taxes. Is, just some clarif clarification, please. Um, Madam Chair, yes. If there's a, a minimum um, uh, tax liability within the state, then then any out-of-state entity would be liable for filing a return and paying Minnesota tax. Yes, okay, thank you so much. Not to detract from the bill, though. It's, it's a phenomenal idea. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Senator Nelson. I also note that there is a, um, that there is a, uh, it's 5% um, uh, of the sales price, but then it's also a non-refundable credit, but it's a carry forward for five years. So um, we would hope that all of it would be usable in that five-year period. Anybody else? Dibble, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Housley, um, for bringing this bill. And I see you have a spot for a co-author, so maybe I could jump on. Um, because it works, Madam Chair, in tandem with the proposal I brought to the Housing Committee, which on the flip side um, would provide some support to uh, potential uh, residents uh, who are trying to access and gain access to low-income home ownership opportunities and providing some support, you know, some small percentage of their ability to buy into what's known as a low, uh, low income or a limited equity co-op, which these um, particular settings are very suitable to. And I see that this is drawn to um, a qualified seller who sells to a home park co-op. So um, it's very complementary to other efforts that are going on, and I appreciate this bill. So thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much, um, Senator Housley and Senate File 2007 will be uh, laid over. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Next bill is um, uh, Senator Dames. Senator Dames is a regular presenter in front of this committee. And today you offer us uh, Senate File 333. There is an A1 amendment. Um, Senator uh, Weber moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. We appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And thank you, members, for hearing Senate File number 333. Uh, Senate file number 333 is a bill that relates to portability of a deceased spouse on used exclusion amount for the estate. Uh, today I have two testifiers with me and Madam Chair if it's okay with you I'll turn it over to the testifiers. Okay maybe um, first um, Senator Dames although we have um, had this proposal before if you would just briefly go through the um, provisions on the, of the bill. Just I'm, I'm walk sorry. Us through, walk us through the session, the uh, sections, if you will. Okay. So section one is uh, 
deals with the return required in case a decedent who has an interest in the property, uh, the personal representative must submit a Minnesota estate tax return to the commissioner in the form prescribed by the commissioner. Sec section number two is Section number two is the uh, subtraction dealing with the estates uh, for decedents dying on uh, or after December 31st. That's been taken out, but subtraction is allowed uh, in computing Minnesota taxable estate. That's that portion equal up to $3 million. Section number three is the uh, taxable amount on the excess over the $3 million. Section number four is the election portability clause of the deceased person. And then the effective date is what the amendment changed, the effective date on line 4.9. And the bill shows June 30th of 2022. The amendment changed that to June 30th of 2023 so that it lines up with the fiscal year. Thank you, Senator Dames, for that review um, and explanation of the amendment. Uh, <clears throat> We'll proceed to your testimony then, if you'd identify yourselves, uh, whoever's going to be first. Uh, uh, for the record, you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. And for the record, my name is Caitlin Bemis, and I'm the Public Policy Specialist at Minnesota Farm Bureau, where I have the privilege of representing nearly 30,000 farmers and ranchers from across the state of Min Minnesota. I'm here in support of Senate File 333, and would like to say, thank Senator Dames for bringing this bill forward. Estate taxes can be a barrier to passing down farms to future generations by draining the financial resources of farmers and ranchers. At the federal level, portability of the estate tax exemption between married couples means that if the first spouse dies and the value of the estate does not require the use of all the deceased spouse's federal exemption amount, then the amount of the unused exemption may be transferred to the surviving spouse. This enables the surviving spouse to use the deceased spouse's unused exemption plus his or her own exemption when the surviving spouse later dies. However, Minnesota's estate tax laws do not currently allow for portability. To ensure that the tax code allows for flexibility in generational transfers, Minnesota Farm Bureau supports the portability of the estate tax exemption. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sir, if you identify yourself, um, please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Justin Stofran. I'm with the Minnesota Farmers Union. Uh, which is a grassroots organization representing family farmers, ranchers, and rural communities in Minnesota. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here to testify uh, in support of Senate File 333 and appreciate Senator Dame's uh, leadership uh, in, in bringing the bill forward. Um, I'll keep my comments brief. This committee uh, has heard other proposals highlighting that farmland uh, has gotten very expensive. Uh, in 2022, average farmland values reached upwards of $6,000, which was a $1,000 increase from the year prior. And in many areas of the state, like uh, those that Senator Dames uh, represents, uh, that number is even higher. Uh, these land values create significant challenges for farm families who are working to keep farms together uh, into the next generation, into future generations. And as any farmer will tell you, that's their number one hope, is to keep a generational farm in their family. Uh, following the, the federal government and allowing spousal estate tax portability will provide flexibility uh, to some farm families who are working to keep their estates intact. Uh, it's not the end all be all, and it uh, won't be used in every case, but this is another tool in the toolbox uh, for uh, farm families who are in transition. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Senator Dames, uh, and thanks to the committee for the opportunity to testify. Are there any comments or questions for Senator Dames? Uh, uh, well, also we have, a, I'm sorry, a testifier online uh, or remote, Mr. Cock, Todd Cock, our coach. Are you with us? <clears throat> Senate Media is with us. I see them on this. <laughs> is he? Is he there? 
I, Christy, if he's there, Christy's trying to get him on. Can't put him on. He's not there. Here. I can't hear you. He's here, right here, but I can't stop my head. Uh, good morning. There he is. <clears throat> good morning, sir. There he is. If you, would, if you would identify yourself for the record, you may proceed with your testimony. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Todd Koch. I'm a CPA and the partner of partnership of John A. Knudsen and Company and a member of the MNCBAs. I'm here to speak in favor of Senate File 333, which would allow portability of a deceased spouse unused exclusion. In short, this bill holds that there is a $6 million exclusion for a married couple rather than $3 million for each person. If one spouse does not use a portion of their exclusion, the unused portion transfers to the surviving spouse. Estate planning is really about getting the right asset to the right person at the right time. Portability allows a married couple to accomplish their estate planning goals in an easier manner. Without portability, we have to add complexity to estate planning. We have to retitle assets. We have to set up a trust. Why can't a married couple have a simple, I love you will? This is a will where one spouse says, I love you, and gives all the assets to the surviving spouse. Upon the death of the surviving spouse, the assets are distributed to the, to the heirs. This often gets the right asset to the right person at the right time in a simple manner. However, if we use an I love you will, the exclusion for the first spouse dies with them. It is never used. This bill allows the assets and the unused exclusion to be transferred to the surviving spouse. If we have portability and I love you will would work for many Minnesotans. The estimated revenue cost of this provision is about $4.7 million per year. In reality, with proper planning, the cost of this provision is nil because with planning, we would have people retitle their assets appropriately. With planning, we would set up trust. With planning, there would be less tax collected. However, estate planning is very hard for people. There is not a specific time frame set by statute. They do not, many people do not realize that Minnesota's exclusion is lower than the federal exclusion, so there's a need for planning. And you have to make decisions on issues you'd rather not face. You have to acknowledge your own debt. Why require couples to prepare plans to get the benefits that are already available to them under current law? The largest states are already getting the benefit of the deceased spouse annual exclusion as they have paid for a plan to make sure that they get the exclusion for both spouses. Let's let all Minnesotans receive the same advantage without requiring additional complexity and cost. Thank you very much. Um, thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Koch. Um, let's see, Senator Klein. Thank you, Chair Rest. I actually have a question for fiscal for Mr. Mum. Uh, the testifier is correct that in 2024, the revenue estimate is $4.7 million, but it seems to increase, you know, almost by 100% annually thereafter. Um, and I wonder, is that something that you anticipate would level off eventually, or is there an explanation for why that sort of accelerates like that in our in our revenue estimate? It, it may be um, the taxable year impact, but let's see. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Klein, um, no, the uh, estimate does not directly explain why that increases, but you're correct that um, it's, it's not a $4.7 million per year cost. That's just the fiscal year 24 amount. It, it increases um, to 9.9 .9 in fiscal 25, and um, for the 26-27 biennium, it's 30.3 uh, uh, million. Anybody else? Um, Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I just would like to, number one, thank Senator Dames for bringing this bill forward. Uh, number two, I'd just like to comment that from 2017 to 2000, uh, through 2020, I chaired the Senate Ag Housing and, uh, and Ag, Senate Ag and Housing Policy Committee. As a result of that, I also served as the co-chair of the Mail C Board. Mail C is the Minnesota Agricultural Educators um, uh, Leadership Council. 
And it's made up of our agricultural educators in Minnesota, but also uh, representatives of the uh, farm management uh, business program that uh, goes through our Minnesota State College system. And transferability of the family farm to the next generation is probably one of the largest problems that exists out there with the increase in values that have occurred uh, and with the fluctuating of commodity prices and land values. Estate planning is, is very tricky and difficult, and, and as a result, um, it, it just has become a big problem. I also think that, to, to Senator Klein's comment, uh, we have an aging farmer population and farm ownership uh, population. And so what you probably see, there is a reflection that as obviously as uh, people continue to age, there's a greater level of death. And, uh, and uh, those numbers, uh, of course, might vary in terms of the portability that's used, depending upon what happens with our agricultural values. Uh, right now, we're at historic highs. Uh, I remember uh, back in 1986 and 7, we were at historic lows for a long time. So um, it's, it's just one of those things that will always fluctuate. And thank you, <clears throat> Senator Weber. Anyone else, or Senator Klein? Anything further? Thank you very much, Senator Thames. Um, and we will uh, thank your witnesses, and we will lay Senate File 333 um, uh, over. Well, thank you, Senator Russ. Um, we truly we did, do. We did amend it, so we'll include that amended motion as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. We truly do appreciate you hearing the bill. And uh, thank you, members, for also hearing the bill. We do appreciate it, and thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Senator Matthews. Uh, we have Senate File uh, 1172 um, before us, Senator Matthews. Madam Chair and members, <clears throat> thank you for hearing Senate File 1172, which would create an electric generation transition aid program to support communities that will be deeply impacted by the retirement of the state's largest power plants in the coming years. Senator this, Matthews, Madam would it be Chair. okay if we, uh, so we don't forget if we added your amendment? Oh yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Senator uh, Weber moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. Uh, motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Thank you very much, Senator Matthews. Uh, thank you for catching that, Madam Chair. Uh, this will include the city of Becker in my district, where three coal burning units at Excel's Energy's Sherco plant will be t retired in 2023, 2026, and 2030, uh, more than a decade sooner than once expected. You may recall that this bill was heard in this committee last year, and a placeholder version of this program was included in last year's conference committee agreement. Uh, with the first of the three Sherco units set to retire this year, we are asking the committee again to move this bill forward to help these communities protect their taxpayers from the massive property tax shifts that can take place at the time of plant retirement. With me today to testify is uh, Greg LaRude from the city of Becker and Max Peters from the city of Cohasset, as well as the Coalition of Utility Cities. Uh, thank you again uh, to the committee for hearing this bill and happy to turn it over to my testifiers. Um, Senator Matthews, could you just briefly again um, for us go just go through the sections very quickly? I can give it my best, Madam Chair. Um, the coalition might also help uh, do that better if I could maybe ask Shane Zark we'll just, to We'll come. just go through it section by section. Okay. I mean, you can just look at it and say what's in that section. That's yep, right. section one uh, will be payment uh, for school districts adding uh, this electric generation transition aid. Uh, section two uh, sets up the uh, general aid program with the definitions. And then on page two, um, there's the subdivision two, there's the uh, elements of the notifications, uh, the transition amount, 
Uh, subdivision four at the bottom onto page three will be the transition aid and uh, page three starts describing how it will taper off uh, in the years uh, to come. Uh, and then subdivision six uh, goes to the Commissioner of Revenue's duties and the payment schedule. Uh, and then uh, sub subdivision seven discusses aid for prior unit retirements, uh, those that have been uh, retired in the last few years back to 2016. And then subdivision eight will be the, uh, the appropriation section. So, thank you, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam That's Chair. Really uh, <clears throat> uh, gentlemen, uh, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself in turn, um, we welcome your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Committee members, my name is Greg LaRude. I am the Becker City Administrator, and I'm grateful to be back before this committee, this time to express the city's support of Senate File 1172. You are all keenly aware of the Sherco power plant closing and the anticipated impact to the local community due to the scheduled closure of the generating units. The upcoming closures of power plants are based on policy decisions that are made far above the local governments. But we appreciate that this committee and the legislature understands that the negative impacts of the closures in terms of job loss and tax base is gonna be intensely felt at the local level. Transition aid is one important way to help mitigate these effects. Transition, transition aid is going to be absolutely critical as a backstop for the city's ability to affordably continue to provide services to our residents as a state transitions to carbon-free electric generation. Once Sherco is fully decommissioned, approximately 65% of the city's tax base will vanish, but the needs, the ongoing needs for tax dollars will not. We are working to replace the anticipated lost tax base by developing a business park, and we hope that is successful, but we are also realistic, realistic enough to know that it will be extremely difficult to replace the entire loss. Having a transition aid formula that not only supports the city's ability to provide services at the current level, but a formula that also adjusts the amount of aid should the city realize new tax base through industrial development is a win for both the city residents and the state taxpayers. And on behalf of the city council, I'd like to thank Senator Matthews for authoring this bill and for the opportunity to testify before you today. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Chair and members, my name is Max Peters. I serve as the city administrator for the city of Cohasset. I also currently serve as the president of the Coalition of Utility Cities. Cohasset is a community of around 2,700 residents located in Itasca County in northern Minnesota. What brings us here today is that we're home to Minnesota's largest coal plant, the Boswell Energy Center. Boswell is a central part of our community. The plant currently represent, represents about 50% of our city's tax base, but in some years has been as high as 70%. The roughly 180 jobs at Boswell are high quality jobs that pay well above the median income in our area, but the plant also indirectly supports hundreds more jobs and economic activity. But Boswell's, number, or Boswell's days are numbered. In November, the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission approved a plan that will cease coal operations at the final two Boswell units in 2029 and 2035. This transition will train, change our community forever. Boswell is a coal-fired power plant that once housed four coal-fired generators. The first two of these retired just a year ago and have already deeply impacted our community. For example, the city did not raise our tax levy at all between tax years 2019 and 2020, but many residents still saw their property taxes jump as a result of retirement of units one. The final units are, are much, much larger, both in terms of generating capacity and their impact on our community, and their impact on our local tax base will be enormous. We are working actively to diversify our tax base to absorb the coming impacts but that work is incredibly difficult and takes time, resources, and even where a city like ours does everything we can, those efforts can still come up short. What this bill represents to us is hope. By providing a glide path to support our city and our region as we work with our partners to accomplish the type of development that will reshape our community. Cohasset has been proud to host the power the plant that has powered our region for decades. The success of Northern Minnesota's iron range, our timber industry, and even tourism have been powered for decades by the stable 24 hours per day power that Boswell provides. 
We can come through this transition, but not without the support of the state, and only if it's built on the pillars of direct transition aid, economic development support, and workforce development. With this bill, you could build one of those pillars this year. Thank you for consideration of this bill, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there comments or uh, questions for Senator Matthews? Um, Okay, uh, I have some, but we'll start with you, Senator Dibble. Oh, just, uh, just, uh, I just wanted to, um, in case I can't remember if Senator Matthews did this yet or not, but uh, Senator Nelson and I were admiring the broad uh, coalition uh, as reflected in the letters of support, the uh, Feel Good Bill of the Year. So I just wanted to make members aware that um, there's a broad range of organizations that support this idea. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Senator Dibble. Um, Senator Matthews. I'm also looking at, I, don't, I guess there's another testifier, but I'm also looking at um, <clears throat> uh, the fact that this is an aid program to local governments. Um, <clears throat> I'm um, uh, uh, counting up in my, on paper <laughs> where uh, the various proposals that are coming before us that are aid programs um, to uh, various levels of local government. Um, and in, a, in your bill, it mentions the school district, and then looking at the um, amounts and um, and the formula for that. Uh, and uh, I am going to inquire of the uh, Department of Revenue the um, uh, why that first year um, seems to be. Uh, 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 raising um, um, questions and and why it goes up and then back down and so we'll look at that and and to and this looks to me to be a, also a scalable proposal so we'll we um, certainly going to look at it very seriously but we have another um, uh, testifier and um, uh, do you want to um, continue at this point? Sure. Well, uh, Chair and members, my name is Shane Zart. I'm with the firm Flaherty and Hood and represent mm -hmm. the Coalition of Utility Cities. And uh, well, one of the things I was going to do, uh, Senator Dibble took the words right out of my mouth, was just to bring attention to the broad range of support in your packets. But also, uh, just up here, since you already heard from a couple of the local governments directly, really just here to help answer some questions since uh, on behalf of the, the coalition in these cities, uh, we've been in discussions with the, the Department of Revenue and, and uh, many of the members of the Senate um, about some of the details of the bill. So if I can be helpful in answering any questions, I'll, I'll stay at the testifier's table. And sure. uh, with that, I'll also just thank Senator Housechild as one of our co-authors on the bill and is on this committee uh, as well. So uh, thank you as well. Sure. Any uh, questions or comments? Um, Senator Hallschild and then Senator Chris Gums. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Matthews for bringing this bill forward. Um, this is really critical. Uh, Cohasset is not in my district, but it's directly adjacent uh, and does power much of my region. Um, and we, you know, we have to make sure that these communities are supported. So whether it's this bill that helps with the, the tax base or my bill that you're also on with regards to grants for economic development, uh, we have to take a multifaceted approach, I think, to supporting these communities. I also know in addition to Cohasset that Hoyt Lakes in my district uh, will face this uh, similar process in the coming years. And so I'm, I'm acutely aware of that and looking to the future of how we can best uh, use best practices to support these communities and appreciate you bringing this forward. Um, thank you, Senator House Child, Senator Gryskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just have a kind of a technical question. On page sure. two of the bill, um, it talks about re required notification and um, the, Where is that, um, Senator Kristinski? Page a, two, what line? Page two, line twenties and twenty and twenty-one. Um, it says that mm -hmm. that the utility must notify the commissioner when the public utility expects to retire the generating unit and remove that unit from the property tax base. So that inspired a question in me: Is okay? So you've got this great big um, property uh, that is that the utility is gonna come forward and say we're gonna take it off the tax base. Does it come off the tax base as soon as they say they're shutting it down? Or does it come off the tax base after 
All of the uh, property is removed. Um, uh, I, I'm just curious how that works functionally, Madam Chair. Well, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chair and, and Senator Draskowski. Um, I will uh, venture into my answer and then defer to maybe even nonpartisan staff or uh, the Department of Revenue uh, to, to fill in some of the details. The short answer to your question, though, is that there is a, a, a lag between when the, the, the event happens in time and when the, the uh, um, event impacts the, the tax capacity for that jurisdiction. Um, and that has to do with the, the assessment schedule, uh, the difference between the assessment year and the pay year for state assessed property, which, uh, you know, as, as you know uh, well, uh, uh, things like power plants, utility property, other types of property in the state that are state assessed property uh, sometimes follow different processes or different calendar uh, than um, um, certain other types of property. So, um, and I, I think a component of your question might be to what is the triggering event? Is it when the plant is demolished or when it's just retired? And in that case, um, the, uh, the answer can be either, but usually there's a uh, distinction between when this, the, the plant is retired for purposes of uh, producing energy and feeding it onto the grid and when that equipment is actually demolished. And, uh, and the, so the answer to that is typically um, the, the, the event that has the impact on the, the jurisdiction's tax base is the retirement of, of the generation at that that site. So the, the plant doesn't have to be demolished, it just has to be retired, no longer uh, producing power and providing it to the grid to be considered retired, and then can go back, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, goes away from the city's tax capacity is maybe a, a fair way to phrase it, um, uh, since uh, uh, this is status as personal property of the utility. Normally personal property is exempt. Uh, operating electric generating machinery is not, but once it stops operating, it, it goes back to uh, uh, that exempt category. It kind of uh, is put out of commission, no longer contributes to the tax capacity. So I think there's, maybe I answered two different questions within your question, but I hope I got to the different components of it. I have, I have a, a, a further um, point on that. The, um, on line 2.19 in the same subdivision, it says, uh, it begins with notwithstanding the requirements of Minnesota rules. So what is it that you're um, asking uh, not to be considered in, um, in this section? Well, thank you, Chair. Uh, the, uh, so Rule 8100 is, uh, as, as I'm sure you know as well, the, um, is the section of, of uh, Minnesota rule that governs the assessment uh, of state assessed property. That, within that chapter, there are, are different timelines and processes by which the utility provides information to the department on a certain calendar. What this section, or what all of subdivision two is, is hoping to get at, is that there's not, even within that process, there's not a specific process or notification for a utility to say, uh, hey, Department of Revenue, we're retiring the Sherco Unit 2, for example, in this year. Um, what, what is provided from the utility to the, the department in the status as property process is a wide range of information in terms of cost, income data, that that feeds ultimately into their, their valuation. But uh, nothing specifically that certifies, you know, from the utility to um, uh, uh, the department that this unit is coming offline. In other words, uh, revenue gets a, the full spreadsheet of, of cost data for everything on Xcel Energy System or Minnesota Power System in that case. Um, not necessarily a breakdown in terms of and a specific notification. Hey, this year when we provide you this information. This, this generating unit is no longer in operation. So we're trying to create an additional notification there so that there's clear communication for the timing of, of these things. And um, it, you know, our, our testifiers mentioned that the, the Public Utilities Commission, of course, plays a, pro, a part in the, the setting the dates for retirement of these facilities. Um, some of those uh, dates that have been approved in integrated resource planning process over at the PUC, for example, might say you know, retired by 2030. Now, whether that takes place in calendar year 2030, 29, there you know, could be some still movement or future uh, PUC processes could. 
uh, help determine that. So even though you know we can point to those integrated resource plans and say with some confidence now that you know we know in, in 23, 26, 2030, that's when the Sherco units are going to go away. Um, this is kind of accounting for that. We need to set up okay. some additional communication so that we know that the utility and the department are always on the same page when one of these things is going away. So I hope thank that's helpful. You. Oh yes, thank you very much. We. We always get nervous when a section begins with notwithstanding a law someplace else. Yes. Yeah. You know, so I wanted to make sure so, about that. Senator, so. Senator Driscowski, had you finished your question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I, well, I, I, I think I, I'm, not, I'm really not super clear yet. But okay. um, I just see that uh, the language inkles that, um, that, that really the decision is it, it doesn't say clearly, but it, it kind of inkles that that the time that the plant is shut down is the time at which is intended here to be the time that it comes off the tax base and that it's initiated by the power company rather than the Department of Revenue. And so I, I don't have a problem with that. I just think it needs to be clear. I mean, we got a huge piece of personal property here that is the department going to say, well, the personal property is still there and uh, we're going to continue to tax it? Or is it going to be clearly off of, you know, off of the tax rolls at the point at which they flip the switch off? Um, I, I just think as, as clear as we can be there would be, would be helpful. And we should do it in law if we, if we make this law. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Matthews, do you have any <coughs> response to Senator Drutowski's um, concern? Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Dreskowski, happy to keep uh, working on that. Our, uh, I will uh, admit I don't have expertise in the tax area, but would be happy to try to uh, keep working with mm -hmm. our proponents and the Department of Revenue and see if uh, there's more we could do. Okay. Um, anyone else? Senator Nelson. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Matthews, thank you for uh, bringing this forward and for really um, digging in. Uh, this was somewhat part of the conference committee last year, but it, it, it came so late, it did not have all the details that were needed. So there was just like a set aside um, uh, funding for this to be worked out. And I just want to say, you've done a great job of working this out. And one, th uh, and getting in, the, I think, the necessary details. The one thing I did in here that I, I think is important to have just on the record um, is the qualifying, uh, like in other words, some communities, it might be a small percent of their tax base that we're talking about. In other communities, it could be almost all of the tax base. So I appreciate the fact that you have added some clarity in there about what percent of the uh, estimated tax base, I think, and maybe if you want to discuss that or your testifiers, I think it's 4%, and then there must be a cap as well on the other end. Okay. Um, Mr. Arneson, um, could you maybe give us some further um, information about um, this kind of proposal and um, its impacts and decision-making points that you're aware of? Um, Madam Chair and members, <clears throat> maybe first I'll uh, start by answering Senator Nelson's question and then, sure. and then get to the more general question. Senator Nelson asked about kind of the... the uh, conditions under which a, a jurisdiction would initially qualify for aid. And the, the, the kind of initial qualification can be found in um, page two, uh, line eight, uh, paragraph F defines unit differential. And this is, this is essentially um, a way to, um, uh, to calculate or estimate the, the uh, value of the retiring unit. And um, for a just jurisdiction, uh, in, which in this bill means county, city, town, or school district, for a jurisdiction to be eligible to generate aid, uh, the uh, electric generation property in that jurisdiction must have been at least 4% of the total uh, tax capacity of the jurisdiction in the assessment year before the um, uh, unit retired. So um, I think the intent is not to, not to uh, generate aid for uh, jurisdictions in which the, the retirement uh, represents only a very kind of small impact, uh, but to kind of establish some floor there. 
And then further, kind of on the other end of the, of the timeline, uh, there's language uh, beginning at the top of page three that describes the conditions under which aid for a jurisdiction would be eliminated. And um, in, in this subdivision, uh, a jurisdiction would uh, cease to generate any aid if the tax base of that jurisdiction, um, you know, after the initial uh, reduction attributable to the unit retirement, if the tax base of that jurisdiction uh, grew uh, to at least 90% of its kind of former magnitude, um, the, the aid for that jurisdiction would be, uh, would be eliminated. Um, and Madam Chair, if, if you would please restate your general question, I'd be happy to try to answer uh, more specifically. I was just asking if you had additional information that would help us. But I'm, I would then, um, looking at the um, uh, revenue estimate, <clears throat> the, um, the second bullet in the detail says that there, the five local jurisdictions would begin receiving aid in 2025 um, with a cost of 2.12 million. And then in FY 2026, um, uh, it doubles and then goes back to 2.8. What, what mm -hmm. is that? Um, How do you explain that? Uh, Madam Chair, um, my explanation of that is that the, the fiscal 25 costs are, are, are the, the three retroactive um, unit retirements. Uh, so if you see in the detail on the first bullet, um, the revenue estimate indicates that since 2016 there have been three units retired uh, that would qualify retroactively under the language of the bill. And then there are two more that come on, come into that calculation, it, would, would that have the impact that we see in 2026 then? Madam Chair, I, I believe that's right. And um, then if you, it, to your previous question, if you read the, I mean, your, your previous question was, why does the uh, revenue estimate indicate um, aid amounts uh, increasing into 26 and then decreasing by 27? But the fourth bullet uh, indicates yeah. that um, of the jurisdictions eligible uh, in pay 25, some of those jurisdictions would would cease to generate aid under the aid elimination provisions mm -hmm. of the bill, uh, and, uh, uh, and those jurisdictions, um, you know, the, the, the aid attributable to those jurisdictions would be uh, would uh, would reduce the aid uh, beginning in fiscal year 27, which corresponds with pay pay year 26. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Arneson, so um, the, the aid is reduced um, five percent for uh, 20 years for those five jurisdictions and then there's is that is the aid um, treated similarly for the ones the additional um, jurisdictions that that will receive the aid just trying to understand the formulas here yeah madam chair um, the 20 year phase out schedule, uh, applies to uh, any jurisdiction eligible for aid. Um, so um, the retroactive, uh, retroactively eligible jurisdictions uh, would phase out their initial aid amount over a period of 20 years. Uh, the kind of forthcoming eligible units would phase out their initial aid amount over a period of 20 years. Um, the, I'll draw members' attention, um, kind of related to your question, at line 3.18 and 119, um, paragraph D provides that the, that the aid elimination provision uh, related to the kind of a, the tax base growth, if, if the jurisdiction's ta tax base appreciates to at least 90% of its former level, that elimination provision doesn't apply to the prior uh, unit retirements. So the, th the three unit retirements indicated on the revenue estimate Clay Boswell, Fox Lake, and Granite Falls, um, the aid for those jurisdictions would not be eliminated under the requirements of Subdivision 5 of the bill. So, uh, Mr. Arneson, Senator Matthews, so um, if we were uh, 
um, which we don't usually do, but if we were looking at um, the extension um, of the um, fund impact to 2028 and 2029, we would expect to see different amounts there. It's not going to ever get to a single amount that then is uh, repeated year after year. I mean, the factors that are in here are going to result in um, uh, a different a different aid amount. Is it likely um, starting in 2028 that that amount is going to go down or up? Uh, Madam Chair, I think it's likely that the general fund impact in years beyond fiscal year 2027 would be larger. Would be larger. Um, okay. And you can kind of think about it as, you know, the, the aid amount is, um, I think, intended to at least initially um, offset the, you know, substantial uh, tax, tax revenue loss for mm -hmm. jurisdictions in which these units are retired. And as the testifiers indicated, um, you know, some jurisdictions, uh, for some jurisdictions, the 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 uh, tax capacity of the electric generating plant is a very substantial portion of their total tax capacity. Uh, and for those jurisdictions, you know, the, the initial aid amount might be, you know, quite substantial, um, more substantial than, you know, for the retroactive uh, retirements indicated in the first year of the. Revenue estimate. So, I think the general answer to your question is that the future aid amounts are likely to be larger than the amounts shown on the revenue estimate. Thank you. Anyone else? Senator Matthews, um, <clears throat> you can tell from the letters and so on, there's considerable support for this, but uh, we need to know the details too. And even though it's not in the uh, revenue impact. That is, it should be important to us, even though it's not counted on our in the in the tails currently. So we need to understand what's what's going to happen in the future. Even if we pass this, um, those dollars, uh, even as they increase, are just going to become part of the forecast. Um, but they uh, they still will uh, cost Minnesota taxpayers to yes. provide to save. One more thing. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> just, just to add one more thing to that, kind of this discussion. Uh, you know, my hope is that, um, uh, like uh, Senator Hochschild's bill, which will lead to economic development in those areas. So we know there's this, this um, sudden, uh, sudden uh, decrease in uh, local uh, taxes uh, generated but hopefully over 20 years, before 20 years, uh, we'll be able to use some very significant economic development tools uh, in our toolbox to replace those no longer functioning plants with other economic development uh, pieces. So my hope is that it isn't a uh, full 20 years, uh, but that at one point there will be new economic development that will then, in a sense, uh, kick them off of the aid formula that you have in here, which I think is, I think this is an elegant solution, quite frankly. So thank you. Okay. Any further comment or discussion? Thank you very much, Senator um, Matthews. Thank you, um, Madam was Chair. There, was there someone else that wanted to testify? Not to my knowledge. Okay. No. Thank you very much. Um, and Senate file... Uh, 1172 is amended. will be laid over. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> next we have Senate file 1479, Senator Weber. Welcome to the committee, Senator. If you would um, begin with an explanation of your bill and what it does, um, <clears throat> and there is no amendment. No, there's not. Thank Senator, you, Madam Chair Senator and members, for hearing this bill. Uh, Senate File 1479 uh, is designed to uh, help in the shrinking workforce in southwest Minnesota. 
Uh, while lines 4.8 to 4.16 are the portions of the bill that apply to this committee, uh, I would, with your permission, Madam Chair, I'd like to give a brief overview of the entire bill so that the members understand what it's trying to accomplish. Yes, please do that. And uh, as we go into this bill, uh, this was brought and developed, uh, the idea came from the mayors of, of many of my communities. Uh, due to the scholarship opportunities that are available in neighboring states and the number of uh, people that it attracts away from southwest Minnesota. The bill is designed as a pilot project uh, offering scholarship program through the Minnesota West campuses which serve southwest Minnesota. A $700,000 uh, request has been made uh, to uh, appropriation for deed for a grant to the Southwest Initiative Foundation who would administer the grant program in cooperation with Minnesota West, the local workforce development boards, and the local business community. Uh, as we go through Bill 1479, uh, Section 1 basically provides us the definitions uh, of uh, Southwest Minnesota or Southwest Initiative Fund and, and the other items mentioned there. Uh, Section 2 uh, establishes this program as a pilot project. And sec Subdivision 3 is a, refers to the grant to the Southwest Initiative Fund. Subdivision 4 lists the colleges, uh, the communities in which uh, Minnesota West colleges are located and uh, talks about <clears throat> uh, how those uh, scholarships will be coordin coordinated and awarded. Uh, program eligibility uh, talks about the students who will be eligible for this program and uh, the renewal of that scholarship in the subdivision six. Subdivision seven deals with the administration uh, through uh, the foundation and Minnesota West Colleges. Uh, subdivision eight is a scholarship recipient requirement. The recipients of these scholarships have to agree to work uh, for a, an employer in, South, in Minnesota for at least three years. And, uh, and so that is uh, one of the requirements that we see that has been very effective in our neighboring states. Uh, and then as we go through subdivision nine, uh, employer partnerships uh, describes them. Uh, the local employer scholarships tax credit starting at 4.8 is that portion of this bill uh, which uh, comes in front of this committee. Uh, what this do, would do is offer up to 50% of the amount of the local employer's scholarship contribution. And it would be capped at 50% of the amount offered or $10,000. This is a non, would be a non-refundable credit uh, that would be given the employer. Then at uh, subdivision 11 uh, talks about report requirements. And, and finally section two was the appropriation of the 700,000 for the overall grant. And, and Madam Chair, that is a short summary of the bill itself. Um, one of our goals is this pro pilot program is to really maximize uh, with a relatively small public investment to many of those we make uh, to bring skilled workers into Southwest Minnesota. And the tax, uh, certainly the tax provision will allow uh, an employer contribution and will hopefully double the amount of money that's available for scholarships. Uh, with me today at the testifier's table uh, is Mr. Eric Simonson, uh, who was here to answer any technical questions about the program itself. But testifying uh, remotely uh, is Mr. Scott Loosebrook of Loosebrook Electric from Laverne, Minnesota, who will talk about the issues involving uh, finding workforce for local employers. Uh, thank you, Senator Weber. We'll hear from your um, testifier. Um, first, and then we'll open it for questions. Welcome to the uh, committee, sir. If you would identify yourself for the record. Good morning, Madam Chair, and, and my name is Scott Loosebrock. I'm the owner of Loosebrock Electrical Construction here in Laverne, Minnesota. Uh, thank you for this time, this opportunity to testify in so full support of Senate File 1479. And thank you to Senator Weber for carrying this important piece of legislation. As a resident and business owner in Southwest Minnesota, I can attest to the unfortunate migration of many of our young people to neighboring states, oftentimes to the attraction of free scholarship in the exchange for three year work commitment like the build, three year work commitment like the Build Dakota Scholarship Program across the border. 
It is a very challenging environment in which we find skilled help, and it is, has negative effect on businesses either wanting to maintain their workforce or in some cases expand. In 2020, I decided to write up a plan that would help our business gain young kids that are interested in the trades and have them on staff. Uh, the plan is where the per person decides that they want to go to the secondary school. So we pay their tuition for two years. After they graduate, they will work for Loose Brock Electric for five years. If they decide on moving from working with us at any time, they must repay the tuition back. I currently have three employees on this program and it works really well for me. Not only am I employing them, but they're also buying homes in our communities. Uh, they're staying here and hopefully someday they'll have families with kids and they'll be enrolled in our school district. The cost for tuition for two years is roughly $15,000. In six years, I've invested in $45,000 in three students, but I have the best workers and employees that you could ask for. We are in full support and really grateful for this bill. And we really truly grateful for the tax credit provision that would incentive, incentivize more small and medium sized employers like myself and participate financially in the scholarship program. We want our communities to grow and continue to grow and thrive in the future. And if this provision helps slow down the migration of young people and I'm 100% behind it. Thank you to all your community me uh, community members in your time and I will stand for any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, questions from others before I ask mine? Um, well, Senator Weber, so um, you're bringing this bill having um, passed through the Jobs Committee um, because it had the appropriation in it for the program and then and then the credit amount is, and that was 700000 and the credit amount is 60000 um, ongoing, correct? That, that would be correct, Madam Chair. So um, without being particularly crass, but what committee is going to be charged with the 700000 The Jobs Committee? That would be the Jobs Committee, Madam Chair. So they're, they would carry that in their, in their budget? And then you're only asking for the uh, credit amount to be um, uh, a feature of the uh, tax committee's target. That is, is right, right, Madam Chair. And um, do have you received a favorable response to that request from the Jobs Committee? We do not know yet at this point if that amount will be there. Um, does the program work? Um, if there isn't the appropriation to get it started. I'm just really trying to get all the details and, and the specifics of the, of the wish list here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't see any problem with the credit, but the startup money, um, that, would, that could be pretty important to the success of it, and it's important to know whether um, it's going to be looked favorably um, by the uh, Jobs Committee. Uh, correct. And I would expect, Madam Chair, that with the timelines that we typically follow around here, uh, I would expect that the uh, their report, yes. the omnibus bill, First. will be out before ours. Right. Can this program be successful with an appropriation that's not quite 700000 uh, I if, will. Uh, if the Mr. Tax Simonson. Committee needs to take some uh, um, sponsorship of it one way or the other. Mr. Simonson has visited with our locals about that issue, I believe, and he okay. has some comments. Mr. Simonson, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Eric Simonson representing the Southwest Council of Mayors. Uh, we've been working on this bill, uh, as you might remember this from last year, but we were working on it for a while trying to refine it. And to answer your specific question, uh, the amount of the, the appropriation that would come through the jobs target, uh, it, I mean, right now it's $700,000, and we think that's a good starting amount. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be difficult for us to, to really launch this program effectively without a general fund appropriation. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that we couldn't do it if we just got the mm -hmm. policy language and the tax credit, but we would be far more effective with some level of general fund appropriation. Okay. Um, 
Senator Weber, we won't we'll, um, look favorably um, on this and um, hope that the Jobs Committee does it as well, and we'll make it work. Very good. Thank, Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, I just give you a chance. Um, Senate File um, 1479 um, is laid over. Welcome to the committee, Senator Rest, and Senate File 2949 is in front of us, and I think you have an amendment. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. <clears throat> uh, Senate File 2949 um, uh, deals with uh, the sales to uh, nonprofit organizations, um, but only if the nonprofit is organized and operated exclusively for the charitable, religious, or educational purposes. Um, I'm going to ask the testifiers to indicate the bind they got in when um, the, um, uh, the, blood, the blood bank um, was um, uh, exchanged hands and uh, none of the activity changed but the taxability um, of the, uh, uh, to them, of um, uh, the sale, of their sales, um, all of a sudden loomed large. And you can see from the, uh, the revenue estimate, um, it begins also with a retroactive amount because the sale w occurred in 2019. Um, the ongoing, um, uh, return or restoration of the uh, sales tax exemption um, is considerably less. But I hope you'll welcome um, the, um, the testifiers to explain the history of the situation, um, the work that the uh, uh, blood centers does, and why this may be a uh, worthy proposal. Senator Rest, before we go to your testifiers, would you like to move the A1 amendment? Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I move the um, A1 uh, amendment, which is uh, uh, includes the um, impact of retroactivity. Senator Rest moves the A1 as an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The mill is in the form you wish, and we will go to your testifiers, beginning with Kathy Geis. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yes, thank you. Thank you for um, having us here. Uh, at the Senate's uh, Tax Committee. My name is Kathy Geist. I'm the Vice President of Operations for Memorial Blood Centers. Uh, we are located at 737 Pelham Boulevard, right at University and 280. So um, Memorial Blood Centers uh, started collecting blood uh, back in 1948 as the Minneapolis War Memorial Blood Bank. The Blood Center was founded by the volunteer-based Minneapolis Junior Chamber of Commerce and the Hennepin County Medical Society after World War II when it was determined and demonstrated that blood transfusion saves lives. One of our first donors was Minneapolis Mayor Hubert Humphrey. And through the 75 year history, Memorial Blood Centers has come to rely on the volunteerism of the citizens of the state of Minnesota to step up and donate and save a life. 
We employ 300 people in Minnesota and coordinate, coordinate the activities of hundreds of volunteers. Annually, annually we collect about 75,000 red blood cells, 27,000 platelets, and 5,000 plasma units, thereby impacting hundreds of thousands of lives um, when that blood is transfused. We are proud to be the primary blood supplier in the state, exclusively supplying hospital systems such as M Health Fairview, Hennepin Healthcare, North Memorial, the Essentia Hospitals, and Children's Minnesota. All 41 hospitals and the air ambulance companies that we support are on the back of your handout. We have nine donation centers in the state, six here in the Twin Cities and four in the Duluth area, and we hold over 800 blood drives with some of the largest corporations in our state to smaller um, faith congregations, communities, schools, and colleges. Our blood drives range from International Falls down to Lakeville and every county and community in between. Before COVID, we even conducted four blood drives right here at the state capitol. While our basic blood collection and processing operations have advanced with the latest technology, our mission has not changed since our inception. Volunteers donate blood, we collect it, test it, process it, and we expertly deliver it to the hospital and patients in need. We are here today because recently the Department of Revenue determined that we're no longer entitled to our sales tax exempt status under Minnesota law, a topic that Katina will touch on next. Before this denial, Memorial Blood Centers was exempt from Minnesota sales tax, just like the only other nonprofit supplier of blood in Minnesota, the American Red Cross. We are very proud to supply roughly 70% of all the blood products used in Minnesota, and we hope to continue to do so. However, losing our sales tax exempt status would jeopardize our longstanding and prominent footprint in Minnesota because we would need to raise prices on our blood products and reduce administrative costs in order to operate. On behalf of all those who benefit from the existence of Memorial Blood Centers, I sincerely hope you support our proposed amendment for the continuation of our sales tax exempt status. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Geist. And Ms. Katrina Peterson, please introduce yourself Katina. and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee members, um, for allowing me the opportunity to be here. I'm Katina Peterson. I'm a tax partner at Dorsey & Whitney. Uh, Memorial Blood Centers is my client. And I'm here today to advocate for 297A.70 subdivision 7, an amendment to that which is included in Senate file 2949. As Kathy mentioned, uh, the organization was originally incorporated in 1948 as the Minneapolis War Memorial Blood Bank. The nonprofit corporation's name eventually changed to Innovative Blood Resources, doing business as Memorial Blood Centers. That organization has been a 501c3 organization since its existence, and it was granted sales tax exempt status by the Department of Revenue in 1969. That exempt status was reaffirmed in 1995 and 2007. And Memorial Blood Bank, until recently, has been operating as a nonprofit charitable organization with um, the blessing from the Department of Revenue with the sales tax exemption under the Minnesota law. As of 2020, Memorial Blood Services operates as the Minnesota-based division of New York Blood Center, also a 501c3 charitable organization. Um, New York Blood Center became the sole member of Innovative Blood Resources in 2016 and eventually merged with Innovative Blood Resources doing business as Memorial Blood Services in 2020. The merger um, was to accomplish more efficiencies. It was two nonprofits, two 501c3s by operating together. They could do more to accomplish their charitable mission and less administrative tasks. Because of the 2020 merger, um, Memorial Blood Service Centers reapplied, had to reapply for its sales tax exempt status under its new name, and that application was denied by the Department of Revenue. Um, the operations of Memorial Blood Centers have not changed, nor has its status as a 501c3 charitable organization. Uh, the department denied the exemption application under 297A. Uh, 0.70 subdivision four, 
uh, this is important when we talk about the amendment. That's the more general exemption for sales to nonprofit groups. Uh, Memorial Blood Centers, we, we disagree with the department's interpretation of that provision. It's a new interpretation because uh, Memorial Blood Centers has been operating under that provision for 53 years with an exemption. Um, so this is a new interpretation. We don't agree um, and we are, we, you know, kind of agreeing to disagree at this point for purposes of this legislation. So in order to preserve Memorial's Minnesota sales tax exempt status, Senate file 2949 amends subdivision seven of that same chapter, 297A.70, and adds nonprofit blood centers to the existing exemption applicable to hospitals, outpatient surgery centers, and critical access dental providers. We're not proposing to amend subdivision four, which is the provision on which we disagree with the department. Um, so in summary, Memorial Blood Centers has been exempt from Minnesota sales tax since 1969, when I think that's right around the time Minnesota enacted a sales tax. Um, if that exemption is lost, the organization will as Kathy described, likely be forced to increase its prices to hospitals, which of course is passed on in many different ways, um, potentially decrease its footprint in Minnesota, which you know, I, I can envision the fallout that would cause given that we supply 70% of blood products to Minnesota and the only other nonprofit supplier is the American Red Cross. Um, so we, we, we ask that the provision be passed because it will preserve what's been in existence now for 53 years. Um, we don't, on, on the revenue estimate, I just looked at that last night. Um, so Memorial Blood Centers has never been paying tax. Um, so the estimate on the retroactivity, because we're still in an ongoing appeal, beginning from tax period 2020, and we haven't paid that tax, there wouldn't be retroactive claims that the state would have to pay out because no tax has been paid into the state by Memorial Blood Centers. And the revenue estimate for the go going forward, the 1.4 million, um, that seems to assume that every expense on Memorial Blood Centers Form 990 would be taxable. Um, and if we lose our exemption, what we would do is we would take advantage of any other um, sales tax exemptions like the industrial production exemption, the capital equipment exemption, um, all of those sorts of things. And um, the revenue estimate, once we would have those exemptions in place, the 1.4 million would be quite a, significantly less. So, I'm happy to answer yeah. questions. Thank so you. Mr. Mr. Senator Chairman, um, I appreciate the um, creativity of, uh, of um, the explanation of um, uh, how of, of the amount of the um, uh, sales tax exemption that appears on the revenue estimate but uh, um, uh, that's not the way scoring is done. And um, it, uh, sometimes we uh, think that the department is doing dynamic scoring, but, but um, that certainly would be, as you described, dynamic scoring and probably not allowed. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can't be um, equally creative and, and keep a sharp pen with, uh, with regard to proposals like this, um, particularly isolating the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the effect of the retroactivity and um, with regard, and this is true for uh, some of the other proposals we have seen and will continue to see um, where we, uh, one, of, one of the years is a catch up year and we've seen that over and over again. And um, I am working on a scheme <laughs> to, to, um, to be able to look favorably on a number of proposals um, like this. And um, I don't know the degree of success in doing that, but I'm certainly going to uh, try. And that's not only 
that's not only here uh, or in this bill, but um, uh, the, if you'll recall, the governor's sale, general sales tax um, uh, proposals, re exemption proposals, um, also had a uh, retroactive effect going back to 2021. And so the first year of, of his proposal, uh, which only lasts for two years, um, um, had a big ticket on the, on the first year. So we're looking at, uh, or I'm um, doing a lot of thinking about um, how, to, um, uh, how to spread that. Um, uh, with the uh, least impact on the uh, tax target. So just stay tuned on that. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> but um, uh, I think this, again, is, um, uh, you know, appreciate the, where the department goes back and, and reconsiders um, the rules and the laws on, uh, uh, on exemptions of, of any kind. Um, but this one um, it seems to me to be as egregious as any there are. So, um, Senator Rest, thank you. We have some questions from the committee. Okay. Um, starting with mine, is this legislation um, specific to Memorial Blood Center, or are there other centers that would be affected by Well, there's only two in Minnesota, so there's the American Red Cross and um, Memorial. There, are other, there aren't any others. That's correct. correct. Th that's correct. This legislation would only affect Memorial Blood Centers and any other nonprofit blood center. That nonprofit blood center, as defined by the FDA rules, that decided to operate in the future in Minnesota. So the American Red Cross operates with a sales tax exemption under a different provision, Subdivision Two, um, because it's an instrumentality of a governmental agency. So it. It, um, the, the department's new theory under subdivision four doesn't affect the American Red Cross, so they would continue to operate under their kind of special um, provision. Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, certainly I agree with the, with the bill and have no problems with that whatsoever. Uh, when you mentioned, uh, to the testifier, when you mentioned the section of law that, by which the department denied eligibility. Mm -hmm. Yes. Could you explain to us what that section says? What, what sure. was the underlying reason for their denial? Sure, sure. So, Ms. Peterson. Pardon? You have to speak to the chair. You just need to know the chair speak. Oh, sorry. That's Go ahead, Ms. Okay. Peterson. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so that, the provision is uh, Minnesota statute section 297A.70 subdivision four. That provision states that um, nonprofits who operate, who are organized and operate exclusively for charitable purposes are exempt from sales tax. So it's a more general to all nonprofits who are organized, operated um, for charitable purposes. The Department of Revenue, um, they have uh, interpreted Minnesota case law, including some of you may have heard of the North Star factors, um, the under the rainbow decision, um, some of the other case law as necessitating that there be um, a gift that's included if you're going to receive the sales tax exemption under that particular provision. And we don't, we don't disagree with that interpretation. Um, our position has been that to the blood bank sells blood products to hospitals at, in, most, in many instances, below cost or below fair market value. And the incremental difference is that's the charitable gift. Um, the Department of Revenue also contends that because we're not providing blood products to the end charitable users, um, the patients receiving the transfusions, that we, we do not any longer qualify for that particular exemption. Um, so they're sort of taking the position that hospitals are not, cannot be um, charitable recipients. That in order to be entitled to this exemption, we would have to be giving blood products directly to patients, which of course we can't do. Um, and it's a new interpretation and we don't agree with it. Senator Weber. 
Oh, thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair. I, I guess I would simply say, it in, in, and Senator Rest said it well, about the egregiousness. We are, what we're seeing here is because of a change in interpretation, now the tax committee is being forced to book a cost that, quite frankly, we shouldn't have to book. And, and, uh, and we've run into this a number of times in the last few years, whether we're talking about um, taxation of, of assets of our REAs, whether we're talking about, I mean, um, at some point I would hope that the department would get the hint that maybe the, some of these interpretations that have been in place for decades um, should be allowed to stand. And, uh, and that's the only comment I wish to make. Other questions or comments from the committee? Senator Dreska. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your comments, Senator Weber. Um, I hope that we can um, have some oversight meetings about this, Madam Chair. Uh, generally, uh, we're seeing a bunch of these and certainly um, a department that um, is create creative and almost activist in their approach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just kind of more to, to, to this discussion, uh, the aspect of the, the interpretation has changed, so now suddenly there's a, a, a cost incurred to this, uh, to, to the committee for um, notwithstanding <laughs> the uh, new interpretation. And, um, and we all have talked about that many times. And, and um, y your testifier alluded to dynamic scoring in looking at the uh, revenue estimate, and we've often talked about dynamic scoring, uh, and um, we don't use dynamic scoring in the state. Some do. But m it does occur to me that in a very narrow, specific case where there's a reinterpretation of tax liability by the Department of Revenue, that at that point, in that very, very narrow, limited place, it would be an ideal place to use dynamic scoring. Uh, in other words, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, taxed before, and so returning it to that non-taxable um, uh, state would, would it, it, I agree with the fact that it's frustrating that instead of doing other tax policy uh, with a, a, a always um, budget targets are somewhat limited, that we need to uh, right the wrong of a um, reinterpretation by a state agency. So Senator just adding to the frustration. Senator Dibble. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, carrying on with the theme of the last three comments. <laughs> um, I, 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 might, I probably missed it. Sometimes my mind wanders during the presentation. But I wanted to unpack um, the retroactivity part of this story. Um, the reason I ask uh, is because, as this committee has heard now a number of times, um, I've had constituents who have run into the circumstance of the Department of Revenue having a new interpretation and then applying their interpretation retroactively and seeking payment for taxes that they then determined should have been paid in the past. What is, what is the timeline of this story? Um, this is 2023, the bill is retroactive to 2019. Um, is, that, is this a similar yeah. story? Senator um, Russ. Mr. Chairman, the, um, the tax was imposed, the new interpretation, in 2019. And as the tax suppliers uh, indicated, they haven't paid it yet because they appealed that ruling. Um, um, but the first time they, as I understand it, that they received notice that they owed the tax um, was from tax year uh, 2019. So that's, that's, uh, that's where the retroactivity comes from. Um, I would uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, I don't know, um, well usually I should say, um, Senator Dibble, if there is litigation um, the tax committee, ongoing litigation, we don't interfere. Um, but as I understand it, this is just an appeal and has a different, uh, different impact than if this matter was in tax court, which doesn't usually deal with sales tax anyway. It usually deals with property tax. 
I, I would, I didn't, when I, I didn't go through the provisions, and I do want, I just, I want to um, uh, make sure that you see that there is uh, a definition, a definitional um, uh, provisions here with regard to exactly what a blood center does <laughs> that uh, uh, is is not chartered or if that's not the right word like by the uh, like the American Red Cross is as an instrumentality of, of government not not a uh, private entity and uh, and those activities are on um, page uh, page two starting with line nine and then uh, usually um, uh, the um, uh, there's not an exemption for the um, use of cars or trucks for uh, for transport of the of the product, um, but that's really what uh, a lot of the cost um, of the blood centers are, and so um, that um, there is a notwithstanding clause, Senator Nelson, and that is um, uh, starting on page three, line one. Um, they're not uh, generally the leasing of cars uh, by the by the organization is not allowed, except there is a notwithstanding type of paragraph um, F beginning at uh, line three point three, which does extend the sales tax exemption to the um, uh, automobiles, um, trucks, buses, whatever that is engaged in the transport of these products. Senator Dibble. Thank you. Um, and that, that, of course, did draw my attention because it has implications I, for I the transportation <laughs> uh, me, uh, division. But um, as I understand, these taxes hadn't been paid. This just um, okay. puts in law practice to date. So my anxiety went down slightly. <laughs> Thank you. I did have, uh, Mr. Chair, um, a comment not related to the bill um, and more probably appropriate for um, either, you know, the division that deals with human rights or health and human services. Um, as I understand, Ms. Geist, um, there's recently been a call for blood donations, particularly those uh, who have a negative blood type, which um, a, few, a few years ago um, at the State Fair, I got my blood typed by the Memorial Blood Center, found out I'm A negative, I didn't know that to date, and offered to donate my blood and was denied because I'm gay, um, which I thought was interesting because Memorial Blood Center doesn't know anything about me other than the fact that I'm an out gay person. I know that um, there has been some effort to destigmatize an entire group of people based on their identity and, and treat uh, out gay men uh, as they would anyone and just ask about their individual circumstances and their individual history and determining whether or not to accept um, their blood donation, but that hasn't quite yet been put into effect. So I'm wondering if you could maybe offline, not putting you on the spot, but just registering because I have a microphone to objecting that stigmatization of people. I think it has been very harmful and destructive to a lot of people and scientifically unsound and has harmed the interests of the Memorial Blood Center and the Red Cross. I have a negative blood type I can't really donate, um, which I think is foolish. Um, yeah. So I'd be interested in knowing how soon you intend to eradicate that policy and just be open to individuals to donate and screen blood based on their own individual circumstances and not stereotype an entire class of people. Um, Senator, um, Senator Mr. Rush. Chairman, Senator um, Dibble, are, are you aware that whether that um, rule you just cited um, about the denial um, uh, to you, is, is that also a rule of the American Red Cross? Senator Dibble. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, the American Red Cross operates under this uh, rule and policy. Um, Memorial Blood Center, I think, just follows that. It's based on um, uh, you know, some, some of the uh, guidance that comes from the FDA as well. So the guidance comes from the federal government, is what you're telling us, Senator Dibble. And are you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Dibble, are are you aware of um, any state that operates uh, 
outside of or in spite of the FDA ruling where your blood would be accepted? Or, some, or so, a gay Mr. person's Chair, blood? Mr. Chair, Senator Rest, no, that doesn't make it right, though. It's no, wrong. No, I'm just right. wondering right. if other states have addressed that right. challenge and came to a different conclusion. And I, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I think Senator Dillier's you're, you're saying yeah. uh, uh, not, but it is yeah. a, Mr. a, Chair. Uh, Senator a huge in, a huge issue of fairness. Yeah. The Amer uh, Mr. Chair, um, Senator Rest, thank you. And I, yeah, it's a big problem, and the American Medical Association has strongly spoken out for a number of years on this practice. Any further comment, Ms. Geis? Uh, yes, thank you. So um, Memorial Blood Centers agrees with you, and we um, are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, and we can't make any changes in this regard without their support. They have put out um, guidance recently, and we're in the 60-day comment period to change all of this, um, to have it be more um, individually based versus uh, an entire community. And we at Memorial Blood Centers are very supportive of the change and have always been very supportive and always outspoken about having some of these changes um, occur. I anticipate, or I've been told by the medical directors at Memorial Blood Centers after this 60-day comment period, which actually may have been extended a little bit, um, it probably would take at least six months to have the changes in place just based on changing our questionnaires, changing our com computer systems that gather all this information, and changing, doing training to all of our people. We will get through this as fast as we can when it is um, enacted and the changes do occur uh, because we would love to have your A-negative donated blood um, uh, that we could distribute to the hospitals in, in the state. Thank you. Thank you. Just one comment for me, I guess, as a physician. So I, I remember practicing sort of at the peak of the AIDS crisis when uh, therapies were uh, not available uh, and in the years thereafter. Uh, and restoring individual patients' trust in the blood supply was actually a very difficult job and led to several medical crises. Um, and and I, unfortunately, this you know, biased and stigmatizing policy developed out of those years of fear. Uh, but it is the right time to correct it, and if it requires legislation, I'd be glad to partner with you on that. Uh, sorry, we're far afield of tax policy, uh, Madam Chair. Um, any closing comments? Lay over the bill. No, I think I just appreciate the um, <clears throat> the uh, committee uh, uh, listening to the issues in this bill in relationship to the department and in the um, in the omission of the uh, blood centers. Um, uh, notwithstanding their policy on whose blood they will accept. With that, uh, Senate file 2949 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion. We have no further business. We are adjourned. Okay. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll see. The, 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 the,